short webinar on what birds you can spot in May. Before we get started, just the usual bit of housekeeping. Um, so please, can you keep your mic muted throughout the talk? At the end, we will have a short about amount of time to ask questions. But if you could wait to the end um, and then we can do those. If for any reason you drop off the webinar for technical issues, um, it still happens. To get back in, you just need to click on the original link you use. So if you drop out, just please click back in. We are going to be recording this session and it will be going on YouTube in a few days afterwards. So if you need to leave before the end of the video, we will be putting it on YouTube and we will email everybody the link afterwards so you can see it. So the webinar today is on what birds you can spot in Devon and is being delivered by Mike Waller from the Environment Bank, who is an ecologist who used to work with us here at Devon County Council. We've organised this webinar and two others this month um, as part of our Naturally Healthy May campaign. Naturally Healthy May is a campaign run by Active Devon and Devon County Council under the Devon Local Nature Partnership. And it's all about encouraging us in May to spend time outside and connect to nature. Um, and there's lots of benefits you can get from that for your physical and mental well-being. And in the chat, I'll put a link to our page all about Naturally Healthy May. So we have this webinar today and then we have one on Friday all about bats. And at the end of the month, we have one on rock calling that Devon Wildlife Trust is running for us. As you probably know, May is such a fantastic time to go out. I was up on Dartmoor after work yesterday. It just feels like everything's growing at the moment. It's Devon just is really green and luscious. Um, so we really want people to use this month to connect to nature, be really present, start to notice things with your different senses. For me, it's all about putting my phone down, going for a walk just before work or at lunchtime and starting to really notice what's about me. Um, I really notice a difference if I take my phone with me or leave it at home because if I take my phone, I'm texting away or sending emails. But if I just go out for 10 minutes, I start to really notice what's around me and particularly now what's emerging. So all the wildflowers are coming out. Um, so last thing before I pass you on to Mike, you might have noticed that this is called What Birds You Can Spot in Devon Part 2. And that's because we ran a similar webinar last year with Mike, uh, part one. And so we will put the link to that video in the chat as well. So if you want to see the different bird species you've covered last year, I'll make sure the link's in the chat. So over to you, Mike. Brilliant. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll just share my screen. I've got quite a bit to get through today quite a few species I thought I'd try and cram in so hopefully I don't go too quickly for you but we're so yeah we're going to we're going to cover three groups of birds we're going to do birds of prey we're then going to look at pigeons and doves and then we're going to look at finches so five species for each these are common species that you should be able to see in Devon and I'm sure many of you have seen so we'll start with the birds of prey let's get to it so the first species, I'm sure many of you have seen this one before, it's the common buzzard. Um, it's uh, quite quite common in Devon. You'll you'll see them out and about on warm days. They um, they like to fly around, um, soar around, looking for um, particularly their they're fond of voles and rabbits. So they like to look for voles and rabbits by soaring around on their um, on thermals on warm days, going round in round in circles. They're quite vocal, they make quite a lot of noise, that sort of kia noise, that kia, which I'm sure many of you would have heard. Uh, but they'll also sit out in the open on posts um, and on hedges as well, looking out for prey, motionless for hours on end. Uh, the distinctive thing about buzzards is they've got quite rounded wingtips, as you can see the picture on the right, rounded wingtips, quite broad wings which they use for soaring around for long periods of time. They've got dark tips to the wings and then a dark edge to the wings, so it's quite distinctive. They tend to be quite mottly, brownish, mottled all over with patches of white. They can, and, and they do vary quite a bit. They can be quite dark brown all the way through to almost completely white, actually. So that one in the middle at the bottom, that's quite a pale one. So there's quite a bit of variation there in the, in the common buzzard. They have quite a dark eye as well. So if you do get to see them close up, it's quite a distinctive feature. So that's the common buzzard, okay? Now, next one, sparrowhawk. Again, some of you might have seen this one around. Now, the sparrowhawk hunts in a very different way. So rather than soaring around at height, 
or sitting motionless for long periods of time, they mostly they tend to hunt um, by surprise. So they they don't hunt voles or rabbits. They hunt birds. They're specialists of small birds. So they'll fly very fast, very low. And so they've evolved to um, to hunt in woodland. So as a result, they've got these quite short, rounded wings. So it means they can move very quickly left and right. So they'll, this will be the species that you'll get in your garden. They'll fly in over a hedge or over the fence very quickly and come flying into the, the bird feeder and snatch a blue tip. That's what they do. Sometimes you'll see them sitting for a little while on a fence, just like the one on the left there, just looking out. They've got this very piercing yellow eye, so quite different to a buzzard. Very long uh, talons, long toes for snatching birds on the wing. And the other thing that's quite interesting about them is that there's quite um, strong sexual dimorphism. So i.e., basically means that there's a big difference in size between the males and the females. So we've got a female there on the left. She's quite big. And the reason she's quite big, why we've got this sexual dimorphism, is that they can uh, make the most of different prey items when they're feeding young. So the female's bigger. She can take things up to the size of a pigeon. And it means that she's not competing with the smaller male who will focus on smaller birds like blue tits. And they're quite different in appearance as well. The female is quite, she's quite bulky and brown. Male's much smaller. He's got that slaty grey, beautiful slaty grey back, almost bluish. And then that sort of orange cheeks and oranges around the edge of the breast as well. It's also not notable that in flight, you can see underneath, they've got quite a uniform barring. They don't have much mottled sort of splodges of brown like the buzzard. Quite a long tail as well. So if you do see them flying around, that's what they look like. And they tend to flap quite a bit as well. So that's the sparrowhawk. OK, next one is the kestrel. So kestrel um, is, you, you, you won't see this one in the garden. This is a species of, again, of open country, of grasslands. They like voles. They will take other things, but they like to hunt voles first and foremost, and small mice. So they'll sit out in the open for long periods of time looking at grasslands. And famously, of course, this is the species that hovers. So they'll hover up in the air, looking down at grasslands, often by the sides of busy motorways and A roads, looking for for little voles to catch. They've got quite long, thin wings, very pointed. So you can see in the top right there, long pointed wings, quite a long tail as well. So that's quite distinctive. Um, again, quite mottly brown generally. So of the, the two sitting pictures here, there's a bit of difference between the male and the female. We've got the female on the right. She tends to be quite, uh, just sort of brownish all over, quite, quite a lot of barring. The male's a bit different. He's a bit more colourful. He's got a slaty grey head. Well, it's not really that obvious in this picture, but he tends to have quite a dark slaty grey head and a much sort of rufous brown back. And that's how you can tell the difference between the two. The male also, when you see the tail fanned out, they've got this big black uh, end to the tail and a slate the, top, the whole tail is sort of slaty grey colour as well. So yeah, you'll see these out in nice open country, sitting out looking for prey. Now, this is a relation of the kestrel. So this is a, just like the kestrel, this is a falcon, the peregrine falcon. I'm sure many of you are aware of the falcon, the peregrine falcon. Um, this is the fastest animal on the planet uh, in a stoop. So like the picture in the middle in a stoop, which is a, a deep dive. They like to dive on their prey in midair. Um, they can reach 186 miles an hour, which is incredibly fast. But you can see why they're built like a fighter jet. Uh, totally built for speed, um, even in a, if, uh, in a straight line, if you see one flying, incredibly fast, uh, an impressive bird. But again, as I say, you can see that sort of similarity with the kestrel. You've got that yellowish around the eye and then this, what they call a moustache, this black, black sort of moustache shape on the, on the cheeks. Now, you'll probably see peregrines. They've become much more common in urban environments in recent years, or say recent years, in the last 50 years or so. So here in Exeter, even on the church local to me, sometimes there's a peregrine sitting there looking out for prey. Um, and the reason for they've moved into cities is because they've evolved to live on cliffs. That's where they like to be normally. So you'll also see them at the coast and they'll sit out on cliff edges looking out for their favourite prey, which is pigeons, rock doves, which we'll talk about in a bit, which are very fast, powerful flyers, which is why the peregrine has evolved to be very fast as well. And as I say, they'll hit their prey from above at such force that sometimes they hit it with such incredible force that it will completely knock the head off the pigeon uh, in one go just because they hit them with such force, which is quite incredible. So these are these are voracious hunters. Um, and the, uh, even things like a buzzard, but buzzard's a bit bigger than a peregrine. Even buzzards will stay away from peregrines because um, they're quite scary things. They're quite powerful birds. So look out for the peregrine next time we're at the coast or even in the city. Now, the last of our birds of prey. Now, this is one that's not that common. This is the rarest of, of the birds of prey in Devon. 
It's the red kite. Now, it's becoming more common in Devon. They're now they're, they're much more common than they used to be. They were down to a few pairs. Um, when my uncle was, just got into birding when he was a kid back in the 70s, 60s and 70s you had to make a special trip all the way to Wales to go and see a red kite and back then there was only 10 pairs left um, and so they had to go all the way into deepest Wales into the Elan Valley and we, they saw some red kites but these days they're doing really well and they're starting to spread across the country and starting to drift into Devon so on nice warm days like maybe not today but over the next couple of months you might see a red kite drift over now, this is the largest of our the birds of prey I'm talking about today but it's a bit bigger than a buzzard the buzzard is probably uh, just a little smaller. They've got longer wings and of course the really distinctive thing is that long fork tail which they use for balancing themselves as they're flying along. They're not particularly active hunters actually, they behave a bit more like a vulture so they like to conserve their energy which is why they've got quite big wings so they can make the most of those updrafts and they'll fly around just looking for bits of carrion which they, they'll snatch off the ground. Now you can always, generally they're quite distinctive even at a long distance because you can see in that flight picture they've got that really obvious black wingtips and then contrast with the white patches and the long tail. So even if they're quite far away you can say oh I think that's a red kite. So worth having a look out for, they are drifting around even in extra I've seen the odd one flying over on occasion. Okay so that's that's the birds of prey, some of the common ones. Now let's have a little look at the pigeons and doves. I was going to say this, these are the pigeons and doves of Devon specifically, but actually they're not. This is pretty much the pigeons and doves of the whole of the, of the British Isles, um, because we don't have a huge number of species, so we'll cover them all. Now, obviously, we're, I think we're all probably quite familiar with the wood pigeon. Um, this is quite a big, it's the largest of, of our pigeons and doves, quite a chunky bird, um, distinctive. It's got this nice white collar, beautiful colouring actually on the neck. This is quite distinctive of, of the pigeon dove family. It's lovely sheen colours. Um, it's actually, it's not chemical colouring, it's, it's mechanical. So it, that means the light hits the feather in a certain way and it refracts the light out, and gives it these specific colours, usually greens, blues and purples. Now, yeah, as I say, they've got this white collar and then when they're in flight, quite distinctive as well, white band on the wings as well. Really powerful flyers, um, but they're, they're high on the list for peregrine falcons as, as a prey item. They nest in trees, they make a sort of bit of a scrabbly nest. It's not the best, they'll nest in all sorts of places, but generally in trees, just made out of a few twigs. Um, and I'm sure you, you will have seen these before, maybe even in your garden. Okay, the next one, this is one that I, th I think is, a, is maybe a little bit more obscure. Not many people have heard of this one. This is the stock dove. Now, it's smaller than the wood pigeon, but it's it's quite um, smaller, but still quite compact, smallish, smallish dove. Um, and I should say as well, I should say this at the start, there isn't any particular difference between a pigeon or a dove. These are just common names. There's no actual difference between them. They're, they're, that they're one and the same. So the stock dove may as well be called the stock pigeon, the wood pigeon may as well be called the wood dove. That is just names that have happened over, over the years. But yeah, so the stock dove, this is a small species. They, um, not one you see very often, but they are still quite common. You see they sort of, they're slightly different to the wood pigeon. Immediately you can see they've got this black eye. So they don't have that orange around the, the, the pupil. So it's quite distinctive. They tend to feed on the ground as well. So you see them in open farmland. Um, and they don't have that white collar and they don't have that white patch on the wing either. They've just got two, you can't really see it very well in these pictures, but they've got two little black bands which they have on the wing. Um, the other quite distinctive thing about the, the, the stock dove is that they, they nest in trees, so they nest in tree holes. So um, if you see a small pigeon coming out of a tree like this in a nest hole, it's probably a stock dove. So one to look out for. I've not seen one for a while. Uh, they're just one that just you see every so often, they're not that common. Our next one is the collared dove. Now, interesting species, the collared dove. Quite common in urban, suburban environments. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, but it's actually a recent colonist. They arrived here only in the 1950s. So um, they're a Southeast European species. And suddenly, in about the 40s, they started to spread across Europe and they reached Western Europe in the 50s. Um, not really sure why this happened, but they just started to expand and they naturally arrived in the UK and colonised during the 1950s. So they're actually quite new, even though I think a lot of people are quite familiar with the collared dove. They're quite a new species, um, but because they came here of their own accord, they're a native, they're not invasive, we didn't bring them here. 
Now, I think they've had a recent decline, actually. They're not as common as they used to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're quite distinctive species. They've got, obviously, as the name would suggest, they've got this thin black collar, otherwise kind of, kind of sort of pale grayish brown all over. Um, and they've, but they have got this lovely, um, you can see in the, the flight picture there, the outer tail feathers, these lovely pale outer tail feathers contrasting with the dark bases, which they fan out just before they land, which is quite distinctive, lovely species. Okay. Now, the rock dove is actually also the same thing as the feral pigeon. So the feral pigeon, which is the one that everyone thinks of that you get in urban environments, swarms of them in city high streets, is actually the rock dove. The rock dove is a native species to the British Isles, native to Devon as well. Um, they're pretty much now only native, the, the proper wild rock dove, which is like the one on the left, uh, with these two very distinctive black bars on the wing, contrasting dark slaty grey head and very pale grey back. They, they nest on cliffs, so that's, that's why they've been able to move, a bit like the peregrine, they've been able to move into urban environments because cliffs are very similar to tall buildings, so they've made that transition to the urban environment. But now, these days, the proper native wild ones, they only really nest in sort of northwest Scotland, on rocky islands, and big cliffs, quite remote places. But many of our feral pigeons still look identical to the native rock dove. Of course, there's lots of other different colour variations you get you'll see of the feral pigeon, different mottled shapes and colours, but one to look out for. And then the final one. Now, of course, this is meant to be um, common birds that you might see in Devon. So this one's a bit of a cheat because you're unlikely to see the turtle dove, which is a real shame because back in the day, of course, this used to be one of our most common species, but no longer. It's in terminal decline, been declining for the last hundred years or so doing really, really badly. And the reason for that is a combination of things. The turtle dove is our only strictly migratory um, pigeon slash dove. Um, so they, they, they winter in, um, in Africa and they come back here for the summer and that puts them at risk. So they're, they're the main target species for, for hunters in the Mediterranean who shoot them en masse. And that has caused a huge decline alongside intensive agriculture. They need a nice, diverse, rich agricultural landscape. And of course, um, our, our landscape has, has slightly become more intensive over the last few years. And so they've declined, which is a real shame because they are absolutely beautiful species. So you wouldn't like to see them, but they are still just about breeding in Devon. There are a few pairs left. Um, and obviously they, they, they get their name. The, the turtle dove is because of the wing pattern there. So you can see that pattern, it's just like a turtle shell. Um, very distinctive call as well, a beautiful array of colours. So if you do see one, it's worth sending the record in for this because they have declined so much in the RSPB and the BTO. Be really keen to know about where, they're, where they are and how they're doing. As I say, I've never seen one in Devon. I've only very rarely seen one in the British Isles, which is a real shame. Um, hopefully that will change in the next few years. Right, so that's the pigeons and the doves. Now we'll move on to the finches. So this is our final group. Now the finches are small birds about the size of a sparrow. They tend, generally tend to eat seeds and they tend to flock together in the winter months together as, as a group, a bit like the tits do uh, for safety and also it just makes it easier to find food when you're in a group and they, they feel a bit safer. So the finches are quite distinctive. They also have, um, they tend to, tend to be quite accomplished singers as well. Um, so if you get to know the songs as well, you can start to identify them even without actually seeing the bird. So worth having a look on YouTube and then you can get your head around some of the songs as well and start to notice them. So let's start with, this is probably the most common. This is the one that you'll be most familiar with. I think the chaffinch has a few years in the rail. Don't, I'm not sure what the results are for the big garden, the RSPB's big garden bird watch this year. But the chaffinch tends to be one of, in the certainly in the top three, if not the first most common species in, in British gardens, and I'm sure that'll be the case in Devon as well. So the chaffinch is, 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 a, is a lovely species, one of our most common. And the other thing you'll notice about the finches is there tends to be quite a bit of difference between the males and the females as well. So on the left here, we've got the male, beautiful colour. We've got this grey, beautiful bluish grey head, and then the lovely plum colour on the front, reddish browns. Um, the female, she tends to be a sort of more pale brown, uh, with some greens in there as well, beautiful colours. Chaffinches are, they're actually more of a, they're a woodland species and so they like to, you'll often see them feeding on the ground. They're not very good on feeders, they tend to pick up seeds along the, on the ground underneath the feeder in your garden. 
Um, and they, they really tend to flock together in the winter months where they'll sometimes join forces with a, a slightly rarer species called the brambling, which they're very closely related to, which sometimes form these mixed flocks. But we won't cover the brambling because they're not that common. In flight, they're quite distinctive as well. You can see the bottom right-hand picture. We've got these, these big whitish wing bars, um, so they're quite distinctive and sort of undulating flight as they're going along. They're very much a sound of the spring as well. The male singing, you yeah, have to look it up on YouTube. I'm not going to do impression because I'll butcher it. Um, but they've got a very distinctive song, which once you get your ear in, you'll uh, you'll recognise it. And, and it tends to be the first bird, the sort of the sign of spring for me is hearing a chaffinch singing. Right, next is the green finch. Now, the green finch is a lovely bird. Look at that. I mean, uh, you can see where it gets its name. But it's not just green, is it? We've got these beautiful yellow wing bars as well. Again, another quite common one in the garden, but you can see it's got a much bigger beak than the chaffinch, much thicker, bigger beak. Um, and they're a little bit bigger than chaffinch. These tend to be quite dominant on the bird feeders. You'll see these chasing off other birds. They've suffered in recent years. Um, there's a virus going around which affects uh, finches, and particularly it's affected green finches and chaffinches as well, actually, where they develop a club foot. Um, and they can't walk very well or land very efficiently as well. Um, and that's being spread partly through um, bird feeders and other reasons as well. So it's good to make sure you clean your bird feeder every so often to make sure you don't spread that virus. But anyway, the green finch, beautiful thing. Declined a little bit. Again, bit of difference between the male and the female. Female there, top right. She's got green, bit of green in her, but generally is a little bit more drab, uh, sort of brownish grey tones there. And again, in flight, quite distinctive. You can see there's a bit of green on the outer parts of the wing and, and those yellow edges to the tail is quite distinctive. The males do a sort of song flight. So they'll sit on the tops of trees and fly up in the air in the, doing the song flight and land again. So once you get the, you get to know the, the, the song, you'll, you'll recognise them doing the song flight, which they're doing at this time of year. So they're very vocal right now. Uh, next one is goldfinch. Goldfinch, obviously, I mean, what a stunning species it is. So beautiful. Um, so beautiful, in fact, that uh, they're still quite a, a, a popular cage bird. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I went to Mallorca with my nan and my mum. And on quite a few occasions, we saw goldfinches hanging in cages, actually, um, in the streets uh, in Mallorca. I don't know whether that still happens, um, but they've traditionally been quite a popular cage bird and you can sort of see why. Hopefully that isn't happening these days. But it's very distinctively, they've got this deep red around the, the, around the beak and then this bright yellow on the wings with lovely white white spots on the on the tips of the of, of the wing feathers there, which makes them very distinctive in flight as well. You can see they've got this very long, very, very fine pointed beak. And the reason for that is they've evolved to wheedle seeds out of, particularly out of thistle seed heads and out of teasels. So these are teasels, the, the, the one that's flying just there is just about to land on a teasel. And again, this one sat on a teasel as well. So they have to tease these seeds out, it's got this very fine beak. If you want to attract goldfinches in the garden, the best thing people always say is to use Niger seed. It's a very fine black seed. You can get Niger feeders and that, that's um, much beloved by goldfinches, but they'll, they'll take sunfire hearts as well. Top right picture is a juvenile. So juveniles don't have the red, so it can be a bit confusing, but you need to look out for that black wing and the yellow wing bar. And that's the distinctive feature. It's not until they get to adulthood that that red, that really deep red develops. So if you're a bit confused, think, oh, could be a juvenile. There's also no real difference here between the males and the females unusually. So I'm sure there are some minor differences, but nothing that you would immediately see. Now, next one's a linnet. Linnet is not one you're likely to get in the garden, but it is still quite a common species. It's what's classed as a classic farmland bird. Again, a bit like the turtle dove, but nowhere near as drastically. It has suffered quite a bad decline, but it's still quite common. So if you're in open country, say you're on the coast, you're on open heathland, maybe you've got Aylesbury Common uh, or on the pebble bed heaths, um, or you're up in North Devon on the coast, you might see a linnet. So there is quite a bit of difference here between the males and the females. The males kind of look like they've been shot with a tiny bullet. But don't worry if you see a bloodstained finch like this, it's just a male linnet. So they flush this lovely deep red colour on their chest and on their forehead in spring, which is exactly what they look like now um, for breeding. Outside the breeding season, that fades away and they sort of go a brownie colour. You usually see a little bit of red left, but right now they're looking fantastic with this beautiful bright red colour. 
As I say, females are a little bit different. She tends to be just sort of a streaky brown colour. Um, they, they even throughout the year, they tend to block together into small groups. Now, the, lane, the name linnet comes from linaria, which is the name for flax, because they love flax seeds. Um, I remember seeing them feeding on flax on a green roof in London. It's almost like they'd, they'd sort of uh, search this, this, these tiny little plants of flax on this green roof. Um, obviously, absolutely love it feeding on those seeds. So this is a species that you'll you'll see out on, on the edges of arable fields and, and farmland and hedges. So one to look out for. Now, this is the last one. This is one you, you may well see in the garden. And to my mind, it's the most beautiful of our finches is the bullfinch. You can see that big, thick beak there. That means that the bullfinch can really crush big seeds down quite efficiently. They're also quite fond. Um, and if you're a gardener, you may already be aware of this. They're quite fond of apple buds and they will strip uh, small apple trees of their buds in spring. Um, so, so they do have a bit of a love-hate relationship, but I don't see how you can hate a bullfinch. Look at it, it's absolutely stunning species. Now, there's a really clear difference here between the male and the female. The male's got this beautiful bright red to orange, but it's more of a red actually when you see it. Really beautiful bright red uh, cheeks and chest contrasting with the black cap. Females more, of, she's still beautiful coloration, more of a sort of greyish plum color. And they'll often hang around in pairs so you can see them side by side and, and notice that it's it's a pair of bullfinches. As I say, this is it is one that you get in the garden. Um, where I'm from in Wolverhampton, for some reason, it's in a city Wolverhampton, we have quite a strong colony of bullfinches and there always has been. So at times I've had up to six in the garden feeding on the the uh, sunflower seeds when I was a kid. Um, but again, they, they have declined a little bit, so they're not as common as they used to be. They've got quite a distinctive call, the bullfinch. They they sound a little bit like a squeaky door. So um, yeah, again, you have to look it up on YouTube uh, or just have a look at online and you'll, you may actually have recognised and think, ah, I've heard that before. It's a bullfinch. It's a squeaky door noise I hear in hedgerows sometimes. They're quite a funny call. They do they do have a, a song that's um, it's not particularly distinctive, but the interesting thing about bullfinches is again, this is a quite a, a, a popular cage bird um, back in the day in the Victorian period. People used to take them and they were able to teach them to sing better. So they can actually be taught to sing differently to their um, to sort of their standard song that they do, which is quite interesting. So people were able to train them to sing. Um, beautiful thing. So just down in the middle there, we've got, that's again, similar to the goldfinch. The juveniles don't develop the big black cap until they get to adulthood. So again, if you see a bird that otherwise looks like a bullfinch, but it just hasn't got that black cap, don't worry, it could just be a juvenile, so worth looking it up. If it's got that lovely grey wing bar, black wings, black tail and the grey back, it's probably just a juvenile. So look out for the bullfinch. Right. I think that's it. I'm sorry, that was obviously quite a, a whip through. We went through a lot of species there, but um, but thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, it was really interesting what you said about the kind of kites, red kites being like vultures, because I see them a lot around Oxford and they're kind of hanging up above the A roads. And so mm. they're very distinct with that kind of curved tail. Um, but you're right, they kind of hover around like um, like vultures. And yeah. I don't think I have knowingly seen bullfinches. Um, my dad's got quite a few um, uh, feeders in his garden and we do sit and watch them, but I'm, I don't think I've seen them in, he's in North Devon, so I'm not sure. Maybe I just need to have another cup of tea and look a bit longer. Okay. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. So if anybody has one they would like, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, anyone has one while I do that I'm just going to share in the chat Mike's previous talk as well so if you click on that it will take you to the Devon County Council YouTube page which has his um, previous talk on what birds you can spot and those are different species so they were the gulls the tits and I can't remember what the other group I think did. it was we did the swallow swift and martins didn't we that's correct yeah yeah, yeah. Um, that's it so there's lots of thank yous. Does anyone have any particular questions for Mike about birds? There's one question in the chat now. Oh. Can you explain the difference between doves and pigeons? 
Well, that's. I, th- I think I, I should have made that clearer that there isn't any difference. There's no difference between the doves and pigeons. They're just they're two different names which have been used randomly and interchangeably. So, for instance, you know, as saying about the rock dove is the native form of the feral pigeon. A dove and a pigeon is one and the same thing. I suppose what it is culturally, we tend to associate the word pigeon with uh, maybe things that we, the species in that group that we don't particularly like so much and doves obviously have that connotations of purity and beauty so smaller species of in the dove pigeon family or the pigeon family tend to be called doves and larger more chunky species are called pigeon but they're all part of the same thing really which is a bit confusing so it's all a bit random (laughs) they're the same family another question we have is can you see linnets in cumbria I'm sure, yeah, you'll be able to see linnets in Cumbria, definitely. I, I just, the, generally, so as I say, they're, they're a farmland bird. They're classed as a farmland bird, but actually they're just as common on heaths and on the coast. So if you go to coastal cliffs or some nice heathland and just look out for them, they tend to sit on the tops of gorse bushes um, with their little, yeah, again, listen to the song. It's got a little sort of chinky call um, and you'll see them on, almost certainly in Cumbria. I can guarantee it. If you look long enough, you'll see them. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Please do check out our other two webinars. So we have, as I said, BATS on Friday at half 12. um, And it's with Sarah Butcher from the BAT group. And then at the end of the month, we have Coral from Wembury Devon Wildlife Trust doing one on rock pulling. But again, thank you very much. And um, I'm going to end the call and the recording now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.